right. So you all heard he just, in the last episode, he's going to, thanks, Mel, for coming on board. You all heard what Mel is saying. This is it. We're now going to come to a conclusion. He's going to bring it all together, and he's going to take a position, obviously, from what A.J. Deuce has uh, taken a position. Mel is going to either agree or disagree. You also can agree or disagree. Waiting to hear. Let's see where you've come with it. Let's see what your conclusion is. Over to you, Mel. Okay. Okay, so... Um, Untangling the mystery of the inscriptions. Here's the big one. Uh, Elzerius Horn was custodian of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem between 1725 and 1726. And basically, he makes uh, a record of the inscription. Um, he did not only deliver designs of a new drum that have been imprinted in countless academic articles, but also a dedicatory inscription, one that only comes as a surprise to those who have not paid attention that was overlooked by the same academics. It means nothing less than the correction of Al Malik's signature to Al Mamun was not there in the early 18th century. Now we also know that not long before Al Malik's signature was not there either. It must have originated in the 1520s and 1530s with Umar's signature. Now I can't read Arabic and I don't know how clear that is to um, Arabic readers, but according to A.J. Juice, the inscription says that Umar was the builder of the Dome of the Rock. This is what uh, Horn had had written down. Um, but later, as we'll see, this was removed and changed. Um, it became Abdul Al Malik for a while, and then later it was changed to Al Mamun. Now, a little bit of an aside. Um, According to detailed architectural drawings undertaken by Ernest Tatum Richmond around 1920, the modern drum is circular. There is no viable case to be made now to be made how mosaics and inscriptions from the previously octagonal drum could have survived. So whatever is there in the drum, and these are not the ones that concern us in any case, but whatever is there, they are new. We can now confidently dismiss all mosaics and inscriptions on the drum and dome as 18th century works, fabrications and fraudulent pretensions. The dedicatory inscription and its adjoining mosaics on the octagonal arcade leave us with few and precise choices within a fairly short period of time during the 16th and 17th centuries, Messianic Jews and Suleiman's successors. Okay, so... The Serpent King Mosaics and Umar Inscription, 1523-1543, Abdul Al Malik's Dedication, 1720-1744 AD. So these are big findings. He says that given the pilgrimage certificate from 1544, the Jewish Serpent King and his royal brother designs on the inner octagonal find their origin then between 1523 and 1543. So that's the design that you see there on the right. It has, it's a very strange one, um, and it's very hard to make out here, but basically it's like a snake's head with a crown on the top, right in the center. Um, so he believes that that was done in the period 1523, 1543. And above that, you can see the Arabic inscription. Um, that's part of the 20 meter inscription that's around the arcade. The inscription is from the same time, but it must have supported Umar originally. Abdul Al Malik's dedication is a likely cover up executed between 1720 and 1744 AD that must have replaced the dedication by Umar from the Serpent King. Al Mamun's correction is from the 18th or 19th century. Do you want to? Let me just, just so everybody's Jumping following you here. We're just looking here at the serpent's head, which is the 1544 uh, mosaic. But you're saying that Abdul Malik dedication, that, uh, do you have a picture of that? that? Can we look at that, that dedication inscription? Is that possible? Now here is the Al Mamun's correction that giving him uh, uh, responsibility for building the Dome of the Rock. Let's take a look at this. And here I'm going to introduce this one right now. And you're saying this is much, much later. This is from the 18th to 19th century or from 1700s to 1800s. Exactly. Yeah. And what what was done is simply that Abdul Al Malik's name was, was taken out and Al Mamun's name was basically pushed into the space that was there, as it were. 
And that's uh, so what we, it, and that's what you're looking at right there is what you see today. This is why, even when I was studying the Dome of the Rock back in the 18 uh, <laughs> in the last century, <laughs> uh, back in 1995 under Gerald Hawking, he put this up there, and I remember him saying. There is a confusion here as to who built it. Mamun's inscription name is there. That was probably added at a later date. You can see it's been added at a, it's been superimposed over top. Okay, so 1804, we see at last evidence of the round drum, uh, at least according to um, AJ Juice. It's, to me, it looks like an acorn. But in, in 1804, Luigi Mayer's view of Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives shows a round drum, but an elongated Coppola. Oh, I see what the difference is. So it's a round drum looking downwards, but it's from the side. The coppola is elongated. So the coppola, even as late as 1804, is still different from what it is today. Let me just um, ask you, look at, back that picture again. Which one are we looking at? The one in the center or the one at the bottom? The, the one at the bottom, yeah. Well, so what's the one, the one in the center then? That looks more like the Dome of the Rock. Um, let me see. Am I wrong? Next to the tower. Just yeah, above, I would have love it to the yeah, left. I, yeah, I'm not no, you have me confused. I I thought that might be in the Holy Sepulchre in the background. The Holy Sepulchre the, is below the Dome of the Rock, though. I mean, and it yeah. looks larger than the Dome of the Rock, which is the other way around. Mm. Today it's the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not yeah. I'm not hundred percent now that you say it. I I uh, I always assumed that either one in the foreground was the one, but maybe I'm wrong. It so. does seem to be because it has the space, it has the whole citadel. The whole citadel yeah. around it, which is open, and it seems to suggest that's the dome of the rock. If that is yeah. the case, then you are correct. The coppola is too is 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 is, is too um, elongated. You're correct. Yeah, it looks very much like an acorn to me. Mm. Um, now we we find um, the following. Then another major restoration is undertaken under Sultan Mahmud II in 1817. So we're only talking just over two centuries ago. The marble of the exterior of the building is restored and a portico over the South Qibla entrance is built. Yet another significant change to the structure appears to have occurred, the cupola. So now we have that lovely rounded cupola that we know of today. Drawings with mosaics of the dome were made by Frederick Carterwood in 1833. His drawings include an outside view and a cross section together with a layout of the mosaics in question. This is the first primary evidence that mosaics on the drum exist. Now we know the mosaics in the drum and al Mamun's correction originate in 1817 and were completed before 1833. So that's when AJ Juice puts al Mamun's correction. So you're only talking about two centuries ago. And so it essentially, the Alma Moon correction occurs not in the ninth century, but literally a thousand years later. So that's quite a massive difference. It's, it's a massive claim. Um, so whether you, I don't know whether you, um, people um, buy into AJ Juice's evidence or not, but I think it's very persuasive to me at least. William Layton uh, Lake's steel engraving uh, from 1841 clearly shows the round drum of the Dome of the Rock and the new cupola. And then we have this picture from a year later, the artist David Roberts draws the Mosque of Omer. That's how it's funny. <laughs> he calls it the Mosque of Omer and not the Mosque of Abdul Malik or something like that. Um, actually, have, have I made a mistake there? There is a, a separate mosque in there, Mosque of Omer in Jerusalem. Do you know, Jay? I don't not I don't know of any mosque of Umar in Jerusalem today. No, um, I presume it's talking about the the Dome of the Rock. Drawing this and calling this the Mosque of Umar, the what building are you referring to? That's the Dome of the Rock that you can see in the background. It must be, yeah, yeah. I just doubted myself there for a second, but then that would indicate that even despite the inscription, the the tradition of referring it to as Umar's Dome of the Rock seems to have. Have survived even the inscription. Have been retained, if incorrectly. Nonetheless, uh, it looks yeah. like there is. It looks like at least there are different, different, different opinions. Now, what's the date on this one, for David Roberts? Um, let me. I'll just, so this would be eighteen forty-two. Eighteen forty-two. Okay. Yeah. So it goes. It does really support AJ Juice's most important 
claim, which is the idea that the inscriptions are very late. You can throw out all the other evidence if you like, but I think the central point that he's trying to make is a very good one, that the inscription does seem to be very late. All of the evidence seems to point in that direction. Um, 1842, there's a, another image of the Dome of the Rock. Here's one from 1862. We can see the exterior tile work was mainly missing. So that again had to be renovated. Um, and so to summarize then, here are the seven holes that we've covered in this series. Go, go back before you do the go summary. Go back. Go yeah. back. Look at these picture, that one there and the one before that. Just go back to the one before that. And then the one before that as well. Notice what is missing on all of these domes. Where's the gold? Yes. Yeah. Where's yeah. the gold? Go back again to these three. And this is something that I had to, I brought up in a debate that I had way back in the 1998, I think it was. I was debating Abdul Green, and he was trying to tell me that we, that the Dome of the Rock, I, I was saying that there's no Qibla. There's no Qibla in any of these structures, and including the Dome of the Rock. And he came back after a break, and he just hammered me and said, Jay, you have no idea what you're talking about. Take a look at the Southern Portico, Above the doorway is chapter 2, verse 145, which talks about the Qibla of change from Jerusalem down to the Masjid al-Haram. Of course, he considers that to be Mecca. And then he says, look at the drum. Look at the drum up here, and you see chapter 17, verse 1, which refers to the Miraj. Uh, that's the only reference we have to this event, where he goes from Mecca up to Jerusalem on, on the back of the winged horse, the Burak, and then bounces up to the seven heavens from this place. And he says, there, that is proof that that uh, this was there from the very beginning. And my risk, for, I remember quickly going back while they went to do their prayers. I quickly went back and went through my books, and I came up with the this kind of, these images. And I noticed that there was no gold. And then I looked at the dates when it was renovated, and it was renovated in 1876. So I came back to him and says, no, you don't know what you're talking about, because what you're looking at are inscriptions and also uh, the, the ones that 17, one and also the two uh, verse uh, chapter two, verse 145 to 149 are were introduced in 1876, just a little over 100 years ago. This was not yeah. there in 691. So I was having this debate back in 1998. Where I That's had to amazing. This. And I, I remember using a picture much like this one right here. And I said, look at the picture. There's no gold there. There's no inscription there. These were added at, in 1876. So we're talking about even after 1841 to 1842, they were added. And that's why you have the beautiful blue inscriptions and you have the beautiful golden dome that is now all, you can see it from everywhere, all over Jerusalem. And it's interesting that they are using these inscriptions to prove their arguments, even though they know that these inscriptions are very late. The, you know, the people in the upper echelons of Islam know the true history. It's, it's just the outside of that circle, people don't know this stuff. Um, What's and fascinating so is when they published that debate, that comeback that I had uh, by looking at the date, they scratched, they edited out of the debate. They edited that surprised. one part. Why do you think they edited? Because they had not, they were not aware that the dome has been rebuilt. And about at that time, I said 11 times, because that's what it said in the book that I was using, that had been built and rebuilt 11 times. Nothing to what J.J. Deuce has done now. Now, A.J. Deuce has actually walked us through how that has been rebuilt. And uh, this has been, especially when you look at these pictures here, you can see this is not the dome that we're looking at today. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to just summarize all of what we've covered, the, the, the big seven holes in the Dome of the Rock. <laughs> Our earliest reference to a Dome of the Rock, i.e. a dome over the Temple Mount, um, is the late 9th century, so very late. Our earliest verifiable witness to the Dome of the Rock mosaics and the inner arcade inscriptions as they exist today is 1523-1543 AD. The earliest witness inscription as to who built the dome was 1523-1543, and it said Umar built it. The earliest verifiable date for the creation of Abdul al-Malik is 1720, 1744 AD. Complete rebuilding of the drum from the ground up, from octagonal to circular, mid-18th century, and possibly later, you know, we take, you know, what you said into account earlier. Um, the mosaics and inscriptions on the drum and the dome are 18th century creations. And lastly, the earliest verifiable date 
for the creation of the Al Mamun correction is sometime between 1817 and 1833. So that, that's quite um, quite a list of holes that AJ Juice has deduced, pardon the pun, from all the evidence. And I think he's done a great job, whether people agree or disagree with um, his, his conclusions. I still think that his contribution to this whole area has been massive with this paper. So I'm gonna hand it back to you. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I mean, you've done a slap up job of reviewing and giving us an overview of Deuce's very lengthy paper. Thanks for doing that, um, Mel. That's been terrific. Uh, we, are, we all appreciate the work you put into this. You've also explained it very well. And I think um, anybody that has looking at that large, that building, that's the third holiest shrine in Islam. It is the shrine that is dedicated to Muhammad going up to the seven heavens called the Miraj. No reference to that at all, except today on the drum that's just around the top of the, from chapter 17, verse one. Uh, and obviously for Muslims, they have always, I've never heard anybody doubt that this was Abdul Malik or that these descriptions were by Abdul Malik in 692. You have done a good job of, uh, or I should say H.A. E. Deuce has done a good job convincing me that we cannot make these statements that clearly anymore. We must be careful when we say this was built by Abdul Malik. What are, what are you talking about? Which part of it was built? Well, we know uh, not the outer part, nor the drum, nor the mosaics at the top, nor the inscriptions around the outside. Those were probably introduced in 1876. Uh, we know uh, from what you've been going through that almost all these, um, well, let me just go back through where you have that. I like where you go back to the seven, the whole seven different criteria from the very beginning. And you give it a check of certification <laughs> after each one. Yep, done that. Yep, done that. Yep, done that. You've missed the last one. But nonetheless, you did six <laughs> of the seven. And what's fascinating is that those are those are those are not suppositions. Those are not intimations. Those are not our experience or or what we do believe or not believe. These are actual following the evidence on the ground. Always following the evidence of the ground. We've come to these conclusions, and that's why we can conclude this. So, in the future, whenever Muslims say these are inscriptions attacking Jesus Christ in the seventh century. No one doubts that Jesus Christ was was attacked. That there were anti-Trinitarian views rampant through that part of the world. But don't use the Dome of the Rock as a support for that. Be careful. That's all we're saying. Be careful because these inscriptions look like they don't even get to introduced until either the 1500s or the 1700s. So we that's all we can say at this point. And certainly this building that is was one of the greatest building of its day that we've always been saying. Could well have been, but this is not it. Not the one we're looking at here. This is not that building. This is a much more, much newer rendition. And of course, it looks like we're not even sure who built this building. Is it Umar? Is it Mamun? Is it Abdul Malik? I would suggest that we don't know. We will never know that. There was probably a building written, built by Abdul Malik. We do know that Umar also built something up there. We do know that uh, when Sophronius came and went into uh, welcome him to Jerusalem after he had conquered Jerusalem, didn't really welcome him, but he, he uh, wanted him to come pray at the Church of the Sepulchre. No, he marched right up to the Temple Mount. As a Jew, that would make sense. He wanted to bring back Judaism. He, I'm sorry, Jerusalem back to Judaism. He wanted to bring. He wanted to see the Messiah return again. This is where he would return. That would make sense. He would have built something there. Could it be this structure? No, obviously not. Now we now know. Nobody, this structure did not exist at all in the 7th century. What did exist? We will never know because that has long gone. But please be careful of suggesting that what we're looking at today is a building that was built by Abdul Malik. We do know that he would have built something there, yes, but nothing and love for what we're saying here. So this whole discussion on these inscriptions attacking the, the divinity of Jesus, attacking the Trinity, attacking his sonship, and that God can have a son. He could not beget, nor is he begotten. These are, yes, important for that time period, but do not use the Dome of the Rock as a, uh, as a proof text that these were, the, uh, that these were there 
to support that. Of course, we do have to take into consideration that there are coins that also reflect these same sayings. We do have the coins of uh, Abdul Malik from uh, 696 and 697. Here is a gold solidus. I'm going to put it up here. And here is a copper, uh, silver, a silver rendition from the more eastern part, uh, what is today Iran, the gold solidus from Damascus. These are coined, minted in 696, and they do have the Shahada, and they do have attacking G not only that God is one, but that he has no associates, which is not the Shahada we have today. That is introduced in 696, 697. So those are there. We're not disputing that because the coins are uh, the coins are probably the best evidence, but we must be careful about suggesting that the Dome of the Rock can also support this injunction or can support these ideas. Not that early. Later, yes, but not this early. Do you want to end and say one thing like that before we uh, head out and go on to another subject? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that, um, you know, this is not the, the final word on all of this. I, I, I think there's enough evidence here to suggest that we shouldn't take it as certain that inscriptions came from the 7th century. There's enough material there to seriously doubt that. Um, so we need to go back to the drawing board. If we are going to affirm that the inscriptions come from the 7th century, we're going to need to find some witness to those inscriptions that early. I, I, I lean towards A.J. Juice being correct on this one, but obviously there is going to be a bit of a debate between uh, people who disagree with his conclusions. But um, I, I think at the very least, people should kind of view this as um, making it less certain than it ever was before. Yes. <laughs> this is what we're doing. We want to sift through. We want to find out. Obviously, the standard Islamic narrative says this was built by Abdul Malik. And this was very clear, as far as the standard Islamic narrative, that this is referring to the Muhammad, the man. Muhammad, he is the prophet of God. That's what the standard Islamic narrative has always told us. That's what all uh, our professors, our seminaries, our Bible school, I'm sorry, our universities have always said. Now, we've just stuck this building into it. We've put the Dome of the Rock into it. We've took the arcade into it. We've put the drum into it. And we've asked and to look and see what's come out from behind. And what we're finding is not at all a 7th century envi environment. What we're finding that comes out is all from the 14, 15, 16, 17, and 1800s, as late as the 19th century. We need to sift this material. We'll continue to do so. We want to give thanks to AJ Dios uh, for uh, doing the research for us. And I especially want to thank you, Mel, for unpacking it so that we can understand it, uh, so we don't have to wade through all that mass of material. But this is a green paper moving into a white paper. What does this mean? How does this have to uh, help with our whole uh, co context of origins of Islam? Well, it puts back the dates hugely, uh, enormously, not at, at all the 7th century. This could be eight to 900 to 1,000, and in some cases, 1,200 years later. Great. Thanks again, Mel. This is, uh, let's see how people respond. Let's see if they agree or disagree. You have the comments right at the bottom. Nonetheless, from Mel and me, to the, uh, through 3,000 miles apart, over and out. <laughs>